it's so serious. I mean, it's about the total breakdown of the judicial system. It took a while to register that uh, nothing was going to happen. There definitely was, was some suppression of evidence and definitely a cover-up of an investigation. What happened in Mena, what happened with the judicial system, probably, most likely, has happened other places and will happen again other places. May happen again in Arkansas. Medellin, Calais, and Bogota, Colombia, the nucleus of the most powerful drug cartels in the Western Hemisphere. 2,000 miles away, hidden in the mountains of Western Arkansas's Wachita National Forest, lies a transshipment point for these cartels. U.S. Customs has estimated that at least 75% of all drug smuggling aircraft have passed through the Mena, Arkansas airport for one reason or another. During the early to mid-1980s, Mena served as a sanctuary for Adler Berriman Seal, one of the biggest, if not the most famous, of all importers of illegal drugs into this country. The Mena story is a tale of drugs, guns, money laundering, and murder, involving an unholy alliance between organized crime, high-ranking U.S. political figures, and the drug kingpins of Colombia. Throughout the years, rumors of a CIA conspiracy and links to a Nicaraguan Contra resupply effort have masked the real players behind this horrific operation. Bill Clinton's election to the presidency of the United States proved to be the catalyst which unwittingly allowed the illegal activities inside his home state to receive national attention. Yet justice in Arkansas has been excruciatingly slow in coming. Many honest law enforcement officials have simply been kept from doing their jobs. In fact, to date, nine separate state and federal investigations into the drug smuggling, money laundering activities at MENA have been shut down. In the fall of 1995, the United States House Banking Committee, chaired by Representative Jim Leach of Iowa, launched investigation number 10 into MENA. Insiders believe the investigation will not be allowed to reach any significant conclusions. At a press conference on October 7th, 1994, the president was asked if he had any knowledge of Mina's drug smuggling, money laundering operations. No, they didn't tell me anything about it. They didn't say anything to me about it. The airport in question and all the events in question were the subject of state and federal inquiries. It was pri primarily a, a matter for federal jurisdiction. The state really had next to nothing to do with it. The local prosecutor did conduct an investigation based on what was within the jurisdiction of state law. The rest of it was under jurisdiction of the United States attorneys who were appointed successively by previous administrations. We had nothing, zero, to do with it, and everybody who's ever looked into it knows that. As governor, Clinton had repeatedly stated that MENA was a federal problem, and as a result, his hands were tied. Although untrue, Clinton managed to shift the blame away from himself. However, with his election to the presidency, Clinton no longer had any excuse. The question must be asked, if drug smuggling activities at MENA are continuing today, as the evidence suggests, why has Clinton allowed it? started investigating the MENA story, I was looking for evidence of some sort of covert government operation, taking into account all the stories that had been circulating about Barry Seal and the CIA. After two years of investigating, another more sinister picture emerged, it involved organized crime and the Colombian drug cartels. In 1982, cocaine trafficker Barry Seal, in order to avoid prosecution, moved his multi-million dollar smuggling operation from Louisiana to the airport at Mina. Seal sought out Fred Hampton's nearly bankrupt Rich Mountain Aviation for use as his new center of operations. It wasn't long, however, before law enforcement officials were on Seal's trail. Internal Revenue Service Federal Agent Bill Duncan and Arkansas State Police Criminal Investigator Russell Welch were assigned to the case. In approximately March or April of 1983, I was in the United States Attorney's Office in Fort Smith, Arkansas. At that time, the U.S. Attorney was Asa Hutchinson. 
During a meeting with him on another matter, DE agent Jim Stepp, who was also in the office, requested that I look into Barry Seal, who had moved his cocaine smuggling operation from Baton Rouge, Louisiana, to Mena, Arkansas. Mr. Stepp told me that he was laundering large amounts of cash and making large expenditures with cash. He indicated that I needed to determine whether or not Mr. Seal or his associates were violating the money laundering statutes. In uh, 1983, I was made aware that Sheriff Hathaway and one of his auxiliary deputies, Terry Capehart, were investigating a, uh, a smuggling operation going on at the Vena Airport. They had a, an inside source of information. Hathaway and Capehart's source turned out to be Rich Mountain employee Lucia Gonzalez, daughter of a Colombian senator. Gonzalez was forced to change her name and go into hiding after her life was threatened by Fred Hampton. The aircraft that, that Barry Seal had there at Rich Mountain Aviation were, there was only one purpose for them. There was only one use for that type of aircraft and that was uh, smuggled cocaine. They had special uh, uh, cargo doors installed in the side without FAA permission uh, so that these uh, doors could be opened in flight. They'd uh, pull in, slide back, and, and the cocaine could be dropped out of the side in flight. Barry or one of his pilots would fly to Mina, where there would be an airplane identical to the one they flew in, sitting there, same tail number. They would get in it, uh, they would be loaded with enough fuel to fly to Columbia. They'd fly to Columbia, pick up cocaine, refuel, and come straight back somewhere over the mainland after they would hit the Louisiana coast, somewhere between there and Mina they would kick the cocaine out at a previously undisclosed location and give coded Loran coordinates and then a ground crew or a helicopter would come in and pick up the, the cocaine. The smuggling aircraft would return to the MENA airport, park next to the plane that originally flown there in, get in it and fly off. And then the rest would be taken care of here until um, the next scheduled mission. My top load paid me one and a half million dollars for a single trip. Uh, a certain degree of money laundering had taken place uh, among these people that were associated with Barry Seal. I gathered extensive evidence that there was money laundering, including um, bank records, direct witness testimony, testimony from some of the individuals that actually participated in the money laundering. All of this was sworn testimony. I was told to deposit the large amounts of cash in uh, amounts of less than $10,000. Even if we had fifteen or twenty thousand dollars, I would go to two separate banks and deposit um, less than ten thousand at one bank and less than ten thousand at another. We fairly quickly received testimony from one of the individuals that worked in the business who told us that they received large amounts of cash from Mr. Seal. Sometimes the cash would be in paper bags that would be left in their office desk drawers. And upon the instruction of Mr. Seal's associates, that money would be taken to local financial institutions and they would purchase cashier's checks in amounts of $10,000 or less to avoid the preparation of currency transaction reports which would have gone to the Internal Revenue Service. Mr. Seal indicated to Russell Welch and myself that his associates at the Mena Arkansas Airport had followed his instruction and had violated the money laundering statutes. He indicated to us that he had told them that they were guilty of violating the money laundering statutes and that they should be prepared to plead guilty. Welch and Duncan had compiled enough evidence to bring indictments against Seal and his associates at Rich Mountain Aviation, including Fred Hampton, Rudy Furr, and Joe Evans. To stay out of prison, Seal became an informant for the Drug Enforcement Administration. This gave rise to the rumor that Seal's activities had been part of a government-sanctioned operation all along. However, Seal's trafficking business had been in progress long before he ever approached the DEA. In fact, Welsh had uncovered the exact date of the deal. I was able to determine the, the time that uh, Barry Seal uh, 
had actually become a, uh, an informant for the DEA. It was March 24th, 1984. Uh, he was about to go to prison, and uh, and he rolled over to stay out of prison and work some cases with him. He's just a snitch. Welsh and Duncan had prepared an airtight case. An Arkansas grand jury was convened in January of 1986. Barry Seal had been subpoenaed and was scheduled to testify. You're dealing with an international cocaine smuggler who moved his entire Air Force, basically, to the state of Arkansas. Everybody in law enforcement that was involved knew it. You had some talented law enforcement people involved in investigating this, gathering hard evidence. You had a United States Attorney's Office involved initially, apparently supporting the investigations, assuring us, at least, that it was serious business. We requested that a money laundering specialist from Operation Greenback in Miami come to Arkansas and review the MENA evidence to see if it was sufficient for indictments. The specialist arrived, reviewed the evidence, was very enthusiastic about it, and drafted, it's my recollection, a 29-count indictment of individuals in the MENA, Arkansas area. And that indictment was to be presented to the January 1986 grand jury. During the midst of the grand jury proceedings, Seal found himself confined to a Salvation Army halfway house. With no police protection or security, he became, in effect, a sitting duck. While awaiting his appearance before the Arkansas grand jury, Seal was suddenly gunned down. Several Colombian hitmen were later charged and convicted of the assassination. Bill Duncan and I interviewed Barry Seal less than two months before he was killed, uh, and uh, he was served with a subpoena at that time. He was under subpoena to come to Arkansas and testify for the grand jury here when he was killed. Apparently, somebody in Arkansas wanted Seal dead because he was murdered before he could show up for that grand jury investigation. Very little is known about the distribution method that Seal had. We do know that one lumber truck from Mena was busted going to Kansas City. It had a lumber facade on the back. When you lifted the lumber up, there was a load of cocaine same driver drove the same route time and time again. Well, the owner of the lumber company was very close to Bill Clinton, Governor Clinton, Buddy Bean. They were never allowed to do a thorough investigation. The whole thing just uh, went down the tubes. Barry Seal's death conveniently prevented the grand jury from finding out who else was involved in the Arkansas drug smuggling operation. The media, while focusing on the Colombians, failed to recognize that Seal's testimony would have caused far more damage to his American associates. For example, who handled Seal's cocaine once it was on the ground? Who paid Seal for his illegal cargo? Was Seal's operation linked to any U.S. political figures? The assassination of Barry Seal would prove to be only the first step in shutting down Welsh and Duncan's investigation entirely. We continued to um, uh, pursue the investigation. But during this time period, uh, the investigative process was becoming very difficult and we weren't able to get uh, uh, access to certain kinds of information that we wanted through subpoenas, certain kind of witnesses. Suddenly, we couldn't get subpoenas. How do you investigate out of a grand jury without subpoenas? How do you go to financial institutions and get records? You can't. Therefore, you can't investigate. You cannot follow the money trail. One. Um, Deputy Foreman of the grand jury uh, came forward and, and said that uh, the U.S. attorney was stonewalling, that he was trying to keep them from doing their job uh, with respect to the mean airport investigation. You have witnesses in Fort Smith, Arkansas, that said they overheard the assist one of the assistant U.S. attorneys up there say that they were told to kill the mean investigation, that they were told to leave the mean investigation alone, that they had indictments ready and they were told to drop them. Clearly the system failed Duncan and Welch. Here's a case where two top-notch investigators are trying to do their jobs and didn't know why the federal government was interfering with their attempts to put a stop to the blatant narcotics trafficking activity of Seal and his associates at MENA. Basically by mid-1986 our investigation was dead in the water. 
because we had no investigative power. We had no way to compel witness testimony. So the cases just died. When we realized that there wasn't going to be any uh, prosecution, uh, that uh, they were pretty much wasting our time, uh, we were tired. Uh, we tried one last, one last time, and, uh, and I probably initiated this by uh, asking uh, Charles Black uh, if there was any state funds to uh, uh, help uh, pursue a local grand jury. We had a meeting at state police headquarters in Little Rock, and it was agreed that since I had worked for Clinton in the past as a uh, campaign worker for him and had personally uh, talked with him before, it was decided that I should approach him with the request for whatever assistance was available on the state level, and I, so I did so. And, and hand-delivered a request to him the following week. I told him, or said in the letter, that at least $25,000 would be required to uh, start a proper investigation. And he told me that he would get a man on it and would get word back to me. I never heard word back from him in, in any fashion. When the election came up, the issue of, uh, of this investigation uh, came up with it. And uh, the question of the $25,000 was brought up by, by somebody, I don't know who. And uh, Governor Clinton said that he had, uh, had offered $25,000. Clinton's statement to the media that he had made $25,000 available for the investigation eventually turned out to be a lie. No attempt was ever made by Clinton to assist in the investigation. In my opinion, based on my 15 years of prosecutorial experience, there is no reason or justification why that evidence was never presented to the grand jury. Charges should have been filed, people should have been charged or indicted. There's no question about that. On the heels of Prosecutor Black's failed attempt came a number of requests from Representative Bill Alexander, a fellow Democrat from Arkansas asking for Clinton's assistance in the MENA investigation. These requests were also ignored. Not only was Clinton uninterested in assisting, it was becoming apparent he was doing everything in his power to keep the investigation from moving forward. One such instance was documented by CBS News in 1990. Winston Bryant had campaigned for Arkansas State Attorney General on the promise that he would get to the bottom of the MENA drug smuggling operations. There was, in my opinion, more than enough evidence to prosecute a number of people for crimes regarding the Barry Seal case at MENA. Once in office, however, Bryant quickly changed his mind. During the 1992 Attorney General's race in Arkansas, either Betsy Wright or a member of Clinton's staff had approached Winston Bryant and had asked him to stay away from the MENA investigation. After um, Winston took office, Bill told me that uh, he was no longer allowed to discuss um, the MENA airport investigation from um, the Attorney General's office. Clinton's interest in keeping a lid on the MENA affair intensified after announcing his candidacy for president. In March of 1992, the Attorney General's office was instructed by members of Clinton's staff to remove all files pertaining to MENA after it was learned that several newspapers were planning to file Freedom of Information Act requests as part of their investigations of Governor Clinton. More than seven months after Seal's murder, Seal's plane, piloted by Eugene Hassenfoss, was shot down over Nicaragua, carrying a load of Contra supplies. This led to the rumor that Seal's drug smuggling had been part of a CIA-led Contra rebel supply effort. After interviewing some pilots that flew guns out of the MENA airport, the time frame revealed that these shipments occurred before the Nicaraguan Revolution. This indicates that MENA was no Contra resupply operation. After SEAL made a deal with the DEA, the CIA also used him to gather intelligence down in Central America and even arranged for him to use a C-123 military cargo plane to fly those missions. Barry Seal continued to profit from cocaine importation and used his federal protection to continue his smuggling operation. That was the very plane that was shot down over Nicaragua in October of 86 carrying supplies to the Nicaraguan Contras. 
This is what hatched stories of CIA drug smuggling at MENA. Even though the C-123 was shot down more than seven months after SEAL was murdered, the pro-Sandinista left was able to point to the fact that Barry Seal, a convicted cocaine smuggler, had once used a plane that later flew supplies to the Contras. This was enough to stir up a lot of stories and confusion in an already complicated scenario. Guns were being flown to South America, and cocaine was coming back on the return flights. Yet, contrary to press accounts, the guns were not going to the Contra freedom fighters, but were in fact being supplied to the drug cartels themselves. Arkansas State Police Officer L.D. Brown, a member of Governor Clinton's security detail, flew with Barry Seal on two of Seal's drug smuggling missions at Clinton's request. The second time we come back uh, from where Seal said we were going, which he said was Honduras, he breaks open a bag and pulls out of uh, what, to me, having worked in narcotics, was a kilo of cocaine. And he had like a number sign and two on it, which I'd seen packaged before. And then, uh, you know, I just, because uh, we supposedly were flying guns, is what he had told me. I didn't, I didn't know what was coming back on return trips. Brown's anger turned to horror after he confronted Governor Clinton outside the governor's mansion. I just said, you know what, they're bringing back, and I'm cursing, you know. And, you know, what, the, on those blank, blank airplanes. And he said, well, what do you mean, what do you mean, what do you mean? I said, they're bringing back Coke. And he says, oh, no, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute. And he throws his hands up and said, that's Laster's deal. And, you know, uh, throughout this whole thing, Laster's name never brought up about anything. And I know Laster, you know, seen him at the mansion, been you know, to his house and sit in his racing box at, at the horse races and all that. And I knew that, you know, that the only time I'd ever seen the governor around any cocaine was at Dan Laster's house when it was on the table when I got him out of there. So just like a, you know, big light goes off in my head. Cocaine, the governor, you know, when he says Laster, I'm thinking, good, oh no. In 1986, Arkansas bond dealer Dan Laster pled guilty and was sentenced to 30 months in prison for cocaine distribution. He was convicted of providing cocaine to young teenage girls in exchange for sex, as well as giving cocaine to his employees and business associates. Lassiter served only a quarter of his original sentence and was eventually given a pardon by Governor Clinton. At Bill Clinton's request, Lassiter gave Roger Clinton, the governor's brother, a job. Roger, seen here, snorting cocaine in a state police surveillance video was arrested and sentenced to prison as part of a narcotics trafficking scheme it was lassiter who paid off roger clinton's drug debts beggars can't be choosers kind of like the first thing and i'm out of the deal <laughs> yeah, well, this is just like saying except this is some good stuff see sam doesn't have any good stuff well that's shit that we took it wasn't bad I don't think that was fucking pretty good. Well, now that, that was mine. That wasn't Sam's. Oh, it was? Yeah. But see, that wasn't as good as I get. Is that right? Wasn't here? No, no. That's just what I had left. I mean, you want a beer? No, I don't care. What kind? No, I'll take a lot. Yeah, I'll take a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Well, what did he do with the You know what I sold him? I'll be honest with you. You know what I sold him? Quarter? I gave him a quarter. You know what I sold it for, to him for? Six fifty. Six fifty. Six fifty. Six fifty. I knew he was scamming. Yeah, it's a nigger. Some junior high nigger kicked Steve's ass while he was trying to help his brothers out. Was he a junior high nigger? Junior high or sophomore in high school or something. Wasn't Whatever it was, Steve had the nigger down. Okay. What, however old he was, it was Steve's fault. He had the nigger down. He let him up. And they were blasting the blind tag. I took three quarters of an ounce up there just because, and I thought I'd have too much. Just so well, like it went in one day and then I didn't have anything left. Hmm. Yeah, this, this is definitely a, a, a good hash brown. So you don't know anything about, um, about the story? <clears throat> um, my buddy here. Hey now, Mark, where's Maurice? 
This is Roger. This is Betty in Arkansas. Bye. That's the problem. He just ain't my little prick if you got any coke. Yeah, he's got plenty of coke. You let him. What do you say? What is your wife? Why is he wants you? to talk to me because he's heard that, that uh, I said, what's wrong? Did you get in trouble? He said, no. He said, I heard the other way around. I said, listen, I told you that last year. You're going to keep hearing that. Who did you hear that from? Well, he hears it from everybody. I hear it all the time. You know, I, I know people talk. I know there's about four detectives here in town that were doing that. I mean, I know for a fact two of them. As a matter of fact, this past week, okay. I've been talking to people in town. Who's that? Well, it's just, it's just a couple of detectives. But see, the thing is, one of them is Travis Bunn. Yeah. The other one, well, that's the only one. I really don't like to say any names because I don't like to even talk about it. Because that's what that's what keeps me one step ahead of the deal. Okay. Because I've got a, I've got about four or five people in uniform that keep an eye on these people that keep an eye on me. You know, and they they uh, these uniform people help me stay one step ahead of the game. Bill Clinton personally approved of at least six hundred and sixty four million dollars in state bonds for Lasseter's company. This was during the same period Lassiter was under investigation for cocaine distribution. Clinton had previously appointed three board members recommended by Lassiter to the Arkansas Development Finance Authority, the agency Clinton set up to issue the bonds. Employees have stated and are willing to testify under oath that both Lassiter and Clinton were involved in the laundering of drug money at ADFA. Lassiter had also been laundering over $100 million dollars through the account of Dennis Patrick, an unsuspecting Kentucky Circuit Court clerk. Coincidentally, this activity came to an abrupt halt within days of Barry Seal's assassination. Recently, both Lassiter and Clinton have publicly tried to minimize their relationship. Yet, sworn depositions from their associates show that Lassiter had backdoor access to the governor's mansion and that Clinton frequently met with Lassiter at his office and even rode on Lassiter's private jets. Lassiter was also a major campaign contributor and fundraiser for Clinton. I thought, well, okay, this thing is a, a drug operation. It's a sting thing. You know, I'm trying to convince myself of that all the way back to Little Rock. And up until the time I meet with Clinton and he blows all that perception and tells me that, no, it's, it's a straight drug deal, L.D. Brown had enjoyed an especially close relationship with Clinton during the time he served on the governor's security team. Brown's sworn testimony linking Clinton and Lassiter with SEAL's operation was extremely devastating. FBI documents show us that the organized crime task force out of Memphis, Tennessee was investigating Lassiter. At the same time, the Arkansas State Police criminal investigators were running their own investigation of Lassiter. And also, the state of New Mexico simultaneously was conducting their own investigation. These were all independent and neither knew of the other investigations going on. We also find that after Lassiter was convicted of cocaine distribution, a couple of years after he gets out of jail, the United States Customs Service had opened a new investigation of him for narcotics trafficking and money laundering. This was in 1989, supposedly after his conversion and after he had found religion. One FBI document that we obtained showed that Lassiter had loaned $300,000 to John Y. Brown, the governor of Kentucky. Lassiter had business in Kentucky. He was close to the governor of Kentucky. Lassiter had business in Arkansas. He was close to the governor of Arkansas. He also had business in New Mexico, and likewise, he was also close to the governor of New Mexico. Everywhere where Lassiter had business, he was close to the governor. He had supported their campaigns, loaned either the, the governor or his family money at different times. There was a drug smuggling operation in Kentucky that was close to John Y. Brown known as the Bluegrass Conspiracy. Lassiter was close to John Y. Brown. In Arkansas, you have MENA, the drug smuggling operation, and Barry Seal. In New Mexico, you have Angel Fire, 
Dan Lasseter being investigated for drug smuggling and money laundering through Angel Fire by United States Customs in 1989. The pattern here is hard to ignore, and it's hard to ignore the potential organized crime aspects of all of this. On May 1st, 1996, Dan Lasseter appeared before the Senate Banking Committee as part of the ongoing Whitewater investigation. For the past 10 years, I have often been the subject of inaccurate, misleading news articles. Outrageous and totally false stories about me have appeared in both the, both the local and national newspapers and magazines. A good example of that was in this morning's Wall Street Journal where I was called a convicted drug dealer by Mr. Simpson. And I challenged Mr. Simpson and Wall Street Journal at this time to prove any evidence that they have on that because that's not been the case. Political opponents of Governor and now President Clinton have sought to use this false information for political advantage. In the process, my reputation has been smeared, my business interests have been damaged. It has never been alleged that I committed any fraudulent act or lied in the course of any investigation. Did I understand you to deny a moment ago that you were convicted for conspiracy to distribute narcotics? No. I said I was not a convicted drug dealer. Well, I was convic convicted of social distribution of cocaine. Mr. Lasseter, there is no crime of social distribution of cocaine. You were convicted of conspiracy to possess and distribute cocaine, a federal felony. Isn't that correct? That is correct, but you I were, did not sell drugs. Mr. Lasseter, you were indicted for conspiracy to possess with intent to distribute cocaine. Is that correct? That is correct, but I, again, you, but, I repeat... That was on a social basis. We'll get to that in a second, but first let's be 100% clear about the crime you pled guilty to, okay? And when you pled guilty, you got up in front of a federal judge? Yes, sir. You raised your hand? Yes, and sir. And swore an oath? Yes, sir. And you admitted your guilt to the crime to which you were charged, correct? Correct. And the crime is possession with intent to distribute cocaine, right? That's correct. And there is no separate crime for social distribution of cocaine, is there? I don't know if it's, a second, uh, if it's a separate crime or not, but I think there's a separate moral issue. So you think it's morally better to give cocaine away than to sell cocaine? That's the distinction you're drawing, right? I guess that is the distinction I'm because drawing. Because when you give it away, you're doing a favor to the people you give it to. Is that your, your thinking about it? I just... I think there's a difference between selling cocaine and using it in a social basis. Now, I'm, we're not talking about using it. We're talking about giving it to other people to use. I just think we need, since you're coming up here and you've made, made an issue in your opening statement about questions of your character and, your, and, and this whole issue of what you were convicted for, let's get straight. In your mind, you see a difference between selling drugs to other people and giving drugs to other people. Yes, I do. All right, and you think it's better to be giving it than selling it? Yes, I do. And you used to give drugs to your employees, right? Yes, I Kind of like a bonus, right? No, sir. It was kind of compensation? No, sir. Did you do it in order to control them or to have leverage over them? No, sir. Mr. Drake, is it... Well, you were an employee of Mr. Lassiter. Yes, I was. You got cocaine from Mr. Lassiter? Yes, I did. Was it your view that Mr. Lassiter used cocaine as a tool to manipulate people? I think that at a time I thought that, yes. And in fact, at a time you told that to a police investigator, <clears throat> right? I could have. You remember an investigator named DeLauder, Dr. DeLauder? Yes. He was an, uh, an investigator with the Arkansas Law Enforcement Authorities? Yes. And you talked to him about Mr. Lassiter and Mr. Lassiter's cocaine activities, right? Yes. You told Mr. DeLauder that in your view, Mr. Lassiter used cocaine as a tool to manipulate his peers? If that's my statement, then I stand by it. And that's what you said in 1986, right? I may have. You also went on to say in this statement that Mr. Lasseter surrounded himself with police officers in order to make himself look like he's a good citizen. You remember saying that? Uh, I don't remember saying it, no. Is there Are a you page reference? Uh... It's the next, very next page. Are you prepared <laughs> to deny that you said that in substance to the investigating officer in 1986? I'm not prepared to deny it, no. All right. Now, I want to ask you, Mr. Lassiter, you gave drugs to your employees, right? Right. 
and you gave drugs to people you were entertaining, right? Right. Even underage people you were entertaining, right? Right. So when we, I just want to make sure we have kind of your moral compass out here that giving drugs away to your employees and to, and to, to people you're entertaining, uh, even if they're underage, that's better than selling it. There's a, there's a, you see a distinction there. That's your position before this committee. I think there's a difference, yes. You know, let me tell you something. I've seen, I've seen, I've put a lot of witnesses on over the years who've done bad things. And I am a firm believer that people do put things behind them and they achieve redemption. But I also know that the first step to that is honesty and accountability for something someone has done wrong. And I have to tell you, I am astonished to hear you say that you see, you actually view your acts as having given drugs away to these people as somehow morally distinct from selling it. Now you also say in your statement, Mr. Lassiter, that you've, it's never been alleged you ever committed a fraudulent act or lied in the course of any investigation. That's in your opening statement, right? It is. You remember uh, when Mr. Locke, your partner in Collins, Locke and Lassiter had a bankruptcy case in federal court in Arkansas? Yes, I do. That was in the early 1980s? Yes. There was a bankruptcy judge named Mixon? Yes, I remember He was that. a federal judge? Yes. You testified in that case? Yes, I did. You, again, you raised your hand and swore an oath? Yes. And do you remember what the judge said about your testimony? I do. What did he say about it? He said it was false. And in fact, he said that you were involved with Locke in a conspiracy to hide assets from creditors, right? That's what he said, but that was inaccurate. So when you say here, it has never been alleged that I committed any fraudulent act or lied in the course of any investigation, you don't consider a finding by a federal judge that you lied under oath to be an allegation that you committed a fraudulent act or lied? No, that is an allegation. I so, stand corrected. So your testimony, so your prepared sworn statement before this committee, we've already established, is false with respect to this statement. It's false in reference to that statement, but I disagree with Judge Mixon. Yeah, but you see, and let me say something, Mr. Lasseter, we didn't catch you unawares with this question here. You prepared this statement. You walked in here to this committee room with this statement to get in the face of this committee and say that we know that it has never been alleged that I committed any fraudulent act or lied. And, and you having put that on the table, you now admit to us that you well and in, and, and in truth know that there was a federal judge who accused you and made a finding that you lied under oath, correct? Did I have a second? All right, let's keep going. Uh, Counselor, I didn't have that in mind when I prepared that statement. I'd forgotten about it, and I apologize. You'd forgotten about the fact that a federal judge made a statement of finding in open court that you had lied under oath and that you had been involved in a conspiracy to defraud creditors of your partner Locke. Right. Now, you were asked, Mr. Drake, about this trip to Belize. I take it, Mr. Lassiter, there was a trip to Belize, right? Yes, sir. And you were on the trip? I was. And, and Ms. Thomason was on the trip? She was. Now, you were read a portion of a, of a report of interview that a, an Arkansas investigator recorded in 1986, Mr. Drake. The investigator recorded of his interview with you, wh which attributes to you, Michael Drake says he later heard around the office that it was also a trip to buy cocaine. Now, my question to you, Mr. Drake, is you previously testified that you're not denying the accuracy of the investigator's report as it was prepared in 1986, you know, roughly contemporaneously with the interview. You said you didn't recall it. Now, are, is it your testimony here that you deny saying this to the investigator? No, I don't deny it. So, you, again, you're in the same position. I mean, you don't remember it, but you're not in a position to say, uh, to deny that the investigator was accurately recording the information you, was, you were giving him at the time. That's correct. And, in fact, we know from you, Mr. Lasser, that you, in fact, did take this trip to Belize. I did. And what was the reason for this trip? Uh, there was a 12,000 acre cattle ranch uh, that was shown to us by a man by the name of Carver, I think it was, or Garver or something out of Oklahoma. And we went, uh, that was a point in time I just sold out of the horse business, had a lot of cash, and I was looking at different investments. Mr. Drake's sworn testimony that the trip to Belize in South America was for the purpose of purchasing drugs is especially damaging 
considering the fact that Patsy Thomason, Lassiter's personal assistant, who Clinton appointed White House Administration Director, was aboard that flight. The committee also overlooked one extremely important piece of sworn testimony from one of Barry Seal's former pilots. The property Lassiter and Thomason were planning to purchase was the exact same piece of property Barry Seal had attempted to buy two years earlier for use in his MENA drug smuggling operation. Ironically, Richard Benvenisti, lead Democratic counsel for the Whitewater hearings, was Barry Seal's former attorney. Benvenisti vehemently denied there were any links between Lassiter and his former client, claiming that such reports were part of the lunatic fringe. Nevertheless, his actions suggested otherwise, after he recused himself from the Lassiter portion of the hearings. A 1988 sworn deposition from DEA Special Agent Ernest Jacobson revealed that SEAL had a history of working with organized crime elements in the United States. Reports documenting Bill and Hillary's connection to organized crime have recently surfaced as well. Even the April 1996 issue of Reader's Digest records Mafia frontman Arthur Coya's extremely close relationship with the Clintons. Coya had loaned and raised millions of dollars for Clinton's campaign and was subsequently given regular access to the White House. During the same period, Coya's racketeering investigation was quietly closed by Janet Reno's Justice Department. Likewise, suspected underworld drug trafficker Don Tyson President of Tyson Foods also had his investigation shut down by Reno's Justice Department. According to a massive number of state and federal reports, Tyson, a major Clinton friend and campaign contributor, managed to elude prosecution for drug trafficking and murder for hire in Arkansas for more than two decades with Clinton's help. In addition, Harold Ickes, Clinton's original choice for Deputy White House Chief of Staff, was forced to withdraw after it was revealed he had ties to the Gambino organized crime family and had previously lied to a federal grand jury. Nevertheless, Clinton chose to bring Ickes on board anyway and immediately assigned him the task of getting the Whitewater scandal under control. Former advisor to the Attorney General in Mexico, Eduardo Valle, recently stated that drug trafficking has permeated all political structures and has corrupted federal, state, and local officials. It has deformed the economy. It is a cancer that has generated financial and political dependence, which instead of producing goods, has created serious problems, ultimately affecting honest businessmen. The Attorney General's office is unable to eradicate drug trafficking because government structures at all levels are corrupted. The prestigious Washington, D.C. newsletter, Strategic Investment, believes the identical situation may exist today in the United States. In September of 1995, they wrote, The Latin American drug cartels have stretched their tentacles much deeper into our lives than most people believe. It's possible they are calling the shots at all levels of government. A little-known charter company in Bogota, Colombia, attempted to buy two Hercules C-130s as seen behind me. Until the U.S. State Department learned that Aviaco planned on landing the airplanes in rural southern United States airports. In 1991, a few years later, Frank Batista Posada, one of the principals of Aviaco, had a, a twin otter seized at the Mena, Arkansas airport. It was known at that time that Batista Posada was a principal also in the Cali, Colombia drug cartel. The Colombian drug cartels have a hold on Mena, Arkansas. The, the late Pablo Escobar, who was head of the Medellin drug cartel, his travel agent, some of his family reside in Mena, Arkansas. It was Colombians that were convicted of killing Barry Seal. Mina was like a transition point from the drug cartels of Colombia and organized crime in the United States. In the town called Fordyce, near Mina, a house of prostitution was an operation which lured key Arkansas political and law enforcement personnel into compromising positions. These men were then photographed without their knowledge for purposes of blackmail. Model Judy Gibbs who appeared in the December 1979 issue of Penthouse Magazine, was one of the primary women used in the operation, along with her sister Sharon. 
A source close to the Gibbs family confirmed there was a sexual relationship between Judy and Governor Clinton. While cooperating with law enforcement investigators, Judy was murdered, found burned to death in her home. In a sworn deposition, Clinton's bodyguard, Barry Spivey, admitted to accompanying Governor Clinton to the location. Question, do you recall any trips to Fordyce? Answer, yes. One of the reasons why I remember the trip to Fordyce is because we flew over the house before it burned. As a matter of fact, I was shown a picture, a penthouse, while I was down there, of her foldout. Question, was the Gibbs matter ever a concern to Governor Clinton? Answer, I don't have access to that information. Seal's partner, Fred Hampton, was very close to the pornography ring and may have been able to keep prosecutors at bay because of incriminating photos he possessed. In late 1993, when I first began researching the MENA airport story, I was extremely surprised to learn that there was, in fact, a large-scale drug smuggling operation still using the airport. I started photographing airplanes and checking tail numbers and discovered that some of the aircraft there were not properly adorned with legal tail numbers, legal designations from the FAA. An informant that worked at the airport had gathered seat cushions from a particular aircraft. These seat cushions had kilo size cuts in them, like a kilo of cocaine, a brick of cocaine. This particular aircraft had just been reupholstered 30 days earlier. Well, uh, Russell Welch took the seat cushions and sent them to the forensics lab in Little Rock for the state police. Well, he had sent the seats in for a residue analysis to find out if there was a cocaine or a heroin residue on the seats. State police responded by saying, not only are we not going to test them, but you're not supposed to be working a case on the, the airport anyway. FBI phone records of Rich Mountain Aviation, Barry Seal's hangar, during the 80s, still in operation today, showed that they were in frequent contact with the Woody Futrell. Woody Futrell was a fundraiser for Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton had also appointed him to the State Board of Police Commissioners. This was the body that governed the state police. I was able to obtain state police inner office memos that members of the state police that wrote the memos thought were destroyed. Anyway, I obtained these documents that showed one of the suspects at Rich Mountain Aviation, Rudy Furr, was able to look at Russell Welch's criminal investigation file, which included an investigation of himself, while Welch was in the heat of that investigation. This indicated that there, there was a great deal of collusion in the state police with the drug smugglers. After years of hard work and professionalism on the MENA case, both Russell Welch and Bill Duncan were about to be rewarded for their efforts. Duncan was instructed by the Internal Revenue Service to lie under oath to the subcommittee investigating MENA. The Internal Revenue Service attorneys were determined that I was going to perjure myself. He couldn't accept that, and Bill Duncan could never accept that. Uh, the, the man is 100% is integrity. Uh, and he ended up quitting the IRS as a result of that. When I refused to give the answer that they instructed me repeatedly to give, they never let up. Over the period of the next few years, he lost his, his house, he lost his savings, he lost his wife, uh, because he, he wasn't going to lie. And I resigned in June of 1989 and left a 15-and-a-half-year career because of the agony of what I had to go through. But he, uh, he gave all that up uh, just for his integrity and for, for the love of his country. He is, uh, there's not a more patriotic uh, country loving, God-fearing man than Bill Duncan. He wasn't going to lie, and the Argus wasn't going to make him lie. Later, Duncan was arrested on false charges of carrying a concealed weapon. I came into the Cannon House office building on a Sunday afternoon to secure some sensitive documents and my personal weapon, and I was arrested by the Capitol Police. I was held for several hours, handcuffed to a wall. He had 
uh, permit to carry the pistol. I mean, he was uh, he was an investigator, and he was uh, uh, there shouldn't have been a problem with it. The United States Attorney's Office in Washington got very quickly involved, charged me with a misdemeanor. They left those charges hanging until December of 1990, during which time I was not able to travel for the subcommittee on crime, and basically the investigation was suspended. Welsh nearly died after being intentionally infected with military-grade anthrax, a poison available only through the government. The doctor uh, told me that uh, she had conferred with other doctors and that uh, uh, the only diagnosis they could come up with was uh, uh, anthrax. She said then it was a military type of anthrax. And I'd read in a uh, newspaper a couple of weeks earlier that there would, had been an outbreak of anthrax among some cows in southeastern Arkansas. And she got in my face and pointed. She said, no. She said, somebody did this to you. Somebody sprayed this in your face. It's the only way you can get it. All of this has been, for the last 10 years, a living nightmare living hell. Um, it's affected Russ's health dramatically. I've almost lost him. He's come real close to death. It's been hard. Being born and raised here, it's hard to believe something like this can go on and nothing be done about it. That it's just swept under the rug and said it didn't happen when you know it did. Despite campaign promises to wage war on drugs, Bill Clinton immediately upon taking office as president fired 80% of the staff of the Office of National Drug Control at the White House. Clinton also fired 355 members of the Drug Enforcement Administration and cut customs drug interdiction budget by one-third. Clinton eliminated 14.6 million from the Coast Guard's drug interdiction budget and slashed the Defense Department's anti-drug budget by 300 million. Drug treatment and prevention budgets were cut by 230 million, despite Clinton's campaign promises to increase them. Most alarming was Clinton's decision to terminate the money laundering section of the Justice Department's criminal division, making it nearly impossible to prosecute major drug traffickers in America. With the United States drug war defense in ruins, a Clinton appointee to the Department of Defense on May 1st, 1995, abruptly shut down radar tracking of drug shipments coming from Colombia and Peru. According to U.S. intelligence officials, an estimated 1,000 plane loads of cocaine and heroin per year would now be free to enter the United States. America as a nation has never been afraid. But today, too many individual Americans are afraid, afraid of violence in our streets, our schools, even in our own homes. What can we do? We can stop the drug use that fuels violent crime and puts all of us at risk. Thousands of communities all across America are working now to end the nightmare of drug abuse and the violence it feeds. Please support the effort in your neighborhood and help return us to our better selves. A message from the Partnership for a Drug-Free America. I did not believe until this happened that things like this really occurred in our country. That the system would not take care of wrongdoing. I always believed that at some point there would be someone who would investigate properly, thoroughly, that had the authority to deal with these types of issues. But what I found out is it doesn't happen. If the American people want honest government, if they want to be ruled by honest people, they should resent that something like this happened and they should demand that it be investigated to ensure that it doesn't happen again. If I could give you the answer to every question that surrounds Arkansas right now, it wouldn't make any difference. What would you do? Uh, if the president uh, uh, committed a felony, if the president obstructs justice, who's going to go knock on the door? Say, Mr. President, come on down to the station. We've got some questions to ask you.
cocaine trafficker Barry Seal, in order to avoid prosecution, moved his multi-million dollar smuggling operation from Louisiana to the airport at Mina. Seal sought out Fred Hampton's nearly bankrupt Rich Mountain Aviation for use as his new center of operations. It wasn't long, however, before law enforcement officials were on Seal's trail. Internal Revenue Service Federal Agent Bill Duncan and Arkansas State Police Criminal Investigator Russell Welch were assigned to the case. In approximately March or April of 1983, I was in the United States Attorney's Office in Fort Smith, Arkansas. At that time, the U.S. Attorney was Asa Hutchinson. During a meeting with him on another matter, DE agent Jim Stepp, who was also in the office, requested that I look into Barry Seal, who had moved his cocaine smuggling operation from Baton Rouge, Louisiana, to Mena, Arkansas. Mr. Stepp told me that he was laundering large amounts of cash and making large expenditures with cash. He indicated that I needed to determine whether or not Mr. Seal or his associates were violating the money laundering statutes. In uh, 1983, I was made aware that Sheriff Hadaway and one of his auxiliary deputies, Terry Capehart, were investigating a, uh, a smuggling operation going on at the Vena Airport. They had a, an inside source of information. Importers of illegal drugs into this country. The Mina story is a tale of drugs, guns, money laundering, and murder involving an unholy alliance between organized crime, high-ranking U.S. political figures, and the drug kingpins of Colombia. Throughout the years, rumors of a CIA conspiracy and links to a Nicaraguan Contra resupply effort have masked the real players behind this horrific operation. Bill Clinton's election to the presidency of the United States proved to be the catalyst which unwittingly allowed the illegal activities inside his home state to receive national attention. Yet justice in Arkansas has been excruciatingly slow in coming. Many honest law enforcement officials have simply been kept from doing their jobs. In fact, to date, nine separate state and federal investigations into the drug smuggling, money laundering activities at MENA have been shut down. In the fall of 1995, the United States House Banking Committee, chaired by Representative Jim Leach of Iowa, launched investigation number 10 into MENA. Insiders, believe the investigation will not be allowed to reach any significant conclusions. At a press conference on October 7th, 1994, the president was asked if he had any knowledge of Mina's drug smuggling, money laundering operations. No, they didn't tell me anything about it. They didn't say anything to me about it. The airport in question and all the events in question were the subject of state and federal inquiries. It was pri primarily a, a matter It's so serious. I mean, it's about the total breakdown of the judicial system. It took a while to register that uh, nothing was going to happen. There definitely was, was some suppression of evidence and definitely a cover-up of an investigation. What happened in Mena, what happened with the judicial system, probably, most likely, has happened other places and will happen again other places may happen again in Arkansas. Medellin, Calais, and Bogota, Colombia, the nucleus of the most powerful drug cartels in the Western Hemisphere. 2,000 miles away, hidden in the mountains of Western Arkansas's Wachita National Forest, lies a transshipment point for these cartels. U.S. Customs has estimated that at least 75% of all drug smuggling aircraft have passed through the Mena, Arkansas airport for one reason or another. During the early to mid-1980s, Mina served as a sanctuary for Adler Barrowman Seal, one of the biggest, if not the most famous of all. Hadaway and Cape Art's source turned out to be Rich Mountain employee Lucia Gonzalez. Daughter of a Colombian senator, Gonzalez was forced to change her name and go into hiding after her life was threatened by Fred Hampton. The aircraft that 
and that Barry Seal had there at Richmond Aviation were there was only one purpose for them. There was only one use for that type of aircraft, and that was uh, smuggle cocaine. They had special uh, uh, cargo doors installed in the side without FAA permission uh, so that these uh, doors could be opened in flight. They'd uh, pull in, slide back, and, and the cocaine could be dropped out of the side in flight. Barry or one of his pilots would fly to Nina, where there would be an airplane identical to the one they flew in, sitting there, same tail number. They would get in it, uh, they would be loaded with enough fuel to fly to Columbia. They'd fly to Columbia, pick up cocaine, refuel, and come straight back somewhere over the mainland after they would hit the Louisiana coast, somewhere between there and Mena. They would kick the cocaine out at a previously undisclosed location and give coded Loran coordinates, and then a ground crew or a helicopter would come in and pick up the, the cocaine. The smuggling aircraft would return to the MENA airport, park next to the plane that had originally flown there in, get in it and fly off, and then the rest would be taken care of here until um, the next scheduled mission. My top load paid me one and a half million dollars for a single trip. For federal jurisdiction, the state really had next to nothing to do with it. The local prosecutor did conduct an investigation based on what was within the jurisdiction of state law. The rest of it was under jurisdiction of the United States attorneys who were appointed successively by previous administrations. We had nothing, zero, to do with it, and everybody who's ever looked into it knows that. As governor, Clinton had repeatedly stated that MENA was a federal problem, and as a result, his hands were tied. Although untrue, Clinton managed to shift the blame away from himself. However, with his election to the presidency, Clinton no longer had any excuse. The question must be asked, if drug smuggling activities at MENA are continuing today, as the evidence suggests, why has Clinton allowed it? I first started investigating the MENA story, I was looking for evidence of some sort of covert government operation, taking into account all the stories that had been circulating about Barry Seal and the CIA. After two years of investigating, another more sinister picture emerged, it involved organized crime and the Colombian drug cartels. In 1982,